Hey everyone, welcome to session 57 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. We're going to get you quickly into today's episode, but first I just want to say uh, some thanks to some sponsors who brought this episode to us today. The first being Constellations Behavioral Services. They are some folks who are local to me here, providing services in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. We'll hear more about them later, as well as the ACT Boot Camp that is taking place in uh, Baltimore at the end of September. Uh, again, we'll hear more details about that further on the show. And then finally, we're going to spend the episode today talking with Jason Simmons, the President and Executive Director of Clinical Behavior Analysis. And we're going to extend the conversation that we started oh, about a year ago uh, with regard to parent training. We're also going to talk about just some organizational uh, behavioral stuff and just a lot of other neat things that they've got going on down there in Kentucky. Lots of great stuff happening in that organization and in that state as well. So uh, I won't delay us any further. So without any further ado, please enjoy this fun conversation I had with Jason Simmons. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey everyone, welcome to this session of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. You know, if you've been listening for a little while, way back in session 36, we did an episode on rapid training and uh, it generated a lot of positive feedback from listeners and so what I wanted to do is bring back the brainchild and creator of the rapid system and go with a little deeper dive and so with that having been said ladies and gentlemen welcome Jason Simmons president and executive hey. director of How clinical behavior analysis hey Jason thanks for joining me today Oh, it's awesome to be here, man. So, so grateful and fortunate to get to do this. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's been about a year since we we talked about this last. And, and like I said, it did generate quite a bit of buzz amongst the listeners and lots of questions and things like that. And in that span of time, uh, I've gotten to know you guys at uh, CBA a little bit better. And, um, uh, and if you, people have listened to the last couple of episodes, they've probably heard the little, the little uh, jingle, if you will, and you guys have become a, a sponsor. Um, and it's because you guys are doing a lot of cool stuff down there in Kentucky. Uh, but one of those things is how, uh, one of, one of the many things that you guys are doing that's, that's, that's pretty exciting is this rapid, uh, rapid training that, uh, you've got going on. So, um, I want to take, uh, an opportunity to take a deeper dive into that and also talk about some of the other cool things, uh, that are again, happening down there in Kentucky. So we got a little bit. It's a great place. <laughs> great yeah. place. A uh, great place to be. Cool, cool. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that's probably true, and it's probably even more true when it's uh, I don't know about you know 20 below here in New Hampshire in, in, in February. So I'm sure it's probably a little bit more temperate than uh, the 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 the, uh, the the climate we get at certain parts of the year. So anyway, um, so like I said, you're the president and executive director of clinical behavior analysis. So I, I wanted to kind of give you a minute to kind of. Uh, talk about how you got into behavior analysis and how you ended up being the, um, you know, the executive director of this, you know, what is, you know, the, you know, probably the largest ABA provider in, in the state of Kentucky. So uh, why don't yeah. you t uh, fill us in from there? Well, I actually uh, went to the University of North Texas, started in about 1994, uh, became a direct support professional in Denton County. Back then they called the uh, county organizations MHMRs. Um, and so I started there. I had no idea. I'm, I think it's my experience is a lot like many others. I sort of serendipitously, you know, came across behavior analysis in my search for trying to find what I really wanted to do. And, uh, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, a lot to my story. Um, I'm starting out as a direct support professional, you know, getting my bachelor's degree there at UNT. I, I took a course. I think it was actually a culture course with Richard G. Smith uh, from the Department of Behavior Analysis at UNT, and then I was hooked from that point forward. I graduated in 98 with my undergraduate in uh, – they have a special degree there for folks who struggle to find what they want to do called the BAAS. It's Bachelor of Applied Arts and Sciences. So I had like a double major in sociology, music, theater, 
uh, and uh, behavior analysis. I was able to kind of put all those together. I went uh, on a trip to Africa with my sociology teacher, and we took uh, some medical technology over to Ghana. It was pretty cool. as these syringes. Uh, that when, when you give the shot, you push the button, the syringe would retract back into the, the syringe. Uh, and uh, my professor back then, Dr. David Williams, uh, kind of encouraged me to talk more to Rick. Um, and it was good timing because as soon as I got back, uh, I went to the department, talked to Rick. Uh, somehow they let me in the program. Um, and then um, once I got into the graduate program, I think, you know, that pretty much changed everything for me because – when I came into his program, uh, he was he's doing a lot of research on self-injurious behavior. Um, and I was there with my colleagues, uh, Travis Blevins, Kathleen Bailey, Dewey Lee, uh, Churchill, Robert Churchill. Um, when I came in, a lot of folks graduated. So it was like kind of like, you know, they left and I was there and he was like, well, you're the guy. And so I, I had unity. Um, over a period of four years, I was able to work one-on-one -on -one with him, and um, we, we did a lot of research. We published some stuff. I became a case manager, uh, Special Olympics. I was volunteering. I had three jobs at one point in time. Um, you know, I had to pay for school myself. And um, over a period of about four years, uh, I graduated from UNT, and my, my friend Dewey Lee, uh, he recruited me out to Louisville to help this hospital that was restraining uh, kids with autism and using the psych model. So we came here, we got rid of restraints on that unit. There were no community BCBAs. So I just said, Hey, you know, this is an opportunity. Let's go in the community, went to the community. And I think, you know, I had one client in Indiana and within 30 days I had 60 clients, you know, and then I had two or three staff and, you know, there was nobody else doing this. Uh, back then it was year 2001. All the services being provided were, were typically provided by a psychologist or or a social worker, or what they call a positive behavior support specialist. Really, it was just someone with a master's degree in a, re in a related field. Uh, so since then, since then, obviously, over the last 18 years, we've been able to build Kentucky ABBA. We've been able to uh, work with uh, a lobbyist. We were able to uh, pass a, a licensure bill in 2010. Um, and that also was put in with an autism mandate around that time, 2014. Um, Medicaid added licensed behavior analysts to the state plan amendment. Um, so a lot of things have happened over that period of time. And in between there, I was back and forth from Texas to Kentucky, uh, settling back here in 2011 permanently. Um, and uh, so I had a lot of good uh, – I'm fortunate because I had so many um, good opportunities during that time. Just out of curiosity, when you first came to Kentucky, what were the funding sources? Because, you know, I was – around back in the day uh i think we're probably mm -hmm. in of, of similar generation x yeah. vintage and um, yeah yeah i uh most of the behavior analytics services were provided in institutional or university or some type mm -hmm. of educational setting and 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 um you know with with maybe some stuff in the community you know and so what was well, what was going yeah. on in kentucky at that time that was it's perhaps el absent elsewhere it's incredible. I mean, you would not believe, uh, you know, I came here, I worked at a psychiatric hospital. You know, that's a very unique opportunity for a behavior analyst in 2001. You know, I remember it so well because during my orientation uh, at this hospital, it's a Catholic hospital, 9-11 happened, you know, during my orientation. So it's like, I don't know, speaking colloquially, I mean, it was imprinted on me. So, you know, that whole initial experience um, so, you know, being in a psych hospital, we pretty much carte blanche, you know, we could do whatever we needed. Our primary goal, though, with uh, Dr. Tucker, Dr. Stalker, all these psychiatrists from Johns Hopkins, from Yale, from Harvard, all these awesome uh, medical folks, they just loved what we did because we brought them data. No one was bringing them data. We're bringing them data and saying, hey, you, you changed the medication here. This is the, what the data reports. This is what we did. So they, they really, they, you know, really liked us. And they were also working in the community. So I didn't really know anything about funding in the community. I uh, originally started billing um, Blue Cross Blue Shield. I was thinking I was one of the first BCBAs to bill insurance over here. And back then, TRICARE uh, had one code. It was like 99109 or something like it was a standard code. Uh, so we became a TRICARE provider. And then what I learned was there were these Medicaid waivers out there. And it's incredible. Uh, these behavior specialists who, you know, had no training in ABA were providing these services called uh, behavior support services. And pretty much 
uh, you know, they're, they're able to provide, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 hours a week of, uh, of services. Um, so, you know, I, I learned about the Medicaid waiver world and, you know, once you become Medicaid certified, it's a lot easier to get into and understand other funding sources because it's so complicated and over-regulated. You know, your policies, I think we had initially 65 policies with one employee we had to have, you know, to meet all the guidelines and regulations. And then uh, in Kentucky, we get audited frequently. We just had back to back three three back to back, actually two concurrent and one right after audit. Um so I think for me that's that's been good for our crew. We have a, about eighty five to ninety staff at this point in time. And our goal and our mantra really is to be audit ready at all times. So uh, this environment just required that. You know, I know a lot of other states where I came from Texas, they didn't have anything like that. There's no way you could you could go into the community, work with an adult or a, or, or a child uh, through a Medicaid waiver for six to ten hours a week, and Medicaid would pay for it. I believe one in four people in Kentucky have some form of disability and get Medicaid. Really? So, yeah, something I believe, whether it's the state plan amendment through the managed care organizations. Right now, there's five contracted uh, MCOs here, uh, and since uh, the, the LBAs were put into that SPA, uh, that opened up additional funding. So we have three Medicaid waivers, brain injury, adult, uh, child, uh, the, the child, the Michelle P. waiver, you can get 40 hours of service. And then we have five MCOs and 17 commercial networks. So, you know, this is a great environment for behavior analysts. There's, there's less than 200 BCBAs here, tons of funding, tons of people that need the service. So, yeah, I never would have thought about coming here. I was recruited here by a colleague. Uh, if I didn't know him, I would have probably been in Colorado. I love it. I love my job. My name is Alyssa and I work for Constellations Behavioral Services. I love my job because I feel like I'm making a difference in children's lives. I think the most exciting piece of the job is really knowing that you're going to be able to help people who are really desperately seeking out support. When I'm interviewing someone I get really excited when people say, I know I don't have all the answers yet, but I'm really excited to make change in kids' lives. I want to research, I want to learn, I want support, I want feedback, I want to see where this field is going. Awesome. So I would say someone coming into Constellations needs to be passionate, excited, willing to learn, willing to grow, and willing to come along for the ride. For more information about job opportunities in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, visit constellationsbehavioral.com forward slash careers. I see. Um, well, we can come back to Kentucky, uh, I guess, and at least talking about the attributes in a little bit. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is, um, you know, how the how you guys develop the the parent training system that you know that that you call um, Rapid. Um, I know, I know, Brandon uh, Franklin gave us kind of an overview of it uh, yes. in that earlier ep- episode, but. Um, and that was great. Now, yeah, yeah, um, that was a fun conversation for sure. Um, but for those who, who may have missed that episode, or you know, obviously it's been uh, over a year, or just about a year since we we aired it, uh, may have forgotten. Uh, if you can um, kind of tell us why you started, it, and then um, after that, um, just give us a brief rundown of what it what it's all about. Okay. Well, um, you know, initially for me. Uh, being like, I think at that time when I was here in Kentucky, there were 10 BCBAs in the whole state. So most of them were at, were at the ICFMR. Uh, there's four ICFMRs here. Okay. And they for, were, for those, they were, can you, uh, can you yeah, tell I'm us sorry, what an, they, for, um, for those who don't know what's an yes, ICFMR? An ICFMR is an intermediate care facility for the MR word. Um, and now they call them ICF IDDs. They've gotten rid of that t- term, but still on the paperwork, I still, we still see, uh, ICFMR, and it's essentially uh, it's an institutional setting that's supposed to be more collaborative with the community. It's a result of lawsuits that occurred in the past because adults weren't able to get out of these institutions, and the Department of Justice really regulates these ICFs uh, so that they 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 sort of mandate getting these folks back out into the community. Um, so th- that's you know there's a lot of work to be done at those the institutions, very structured, very intensive, very expensive. Um, and so, uh, you know, at that particular time, working in the community and through Medicaid waivers, uh, I could see the writing on the wall. You know, these folks, these ICMR, they're shutting them down. They want folks in the community. Why? 
Well, it's not only better for the patients, but it's cheaper. It's probably half or less or than that, even probably a third of the cost uh, to, to have someone in, in an institutional setting. So when you do Medicaid waiver, you know, there's a whole heavy set of regulations. So your, your assessment has to, has to include certain items, whether you like it or not. You, you've got to have it in there. Uh, so, you know, you have these 10 page assessments and you have these, you know, eight to 10 page behavior plans because not because you want to necessarily, but because it's required. You have a set of regulations. It has to address all of these things. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't always quite make sense. You know, it's just, it's just what it is. You have to follow. So, uh, as you know, when you're working with caretakers and families, you walk in with a, a 10 page behavior plan. Oftentimes this staff group, you know, they know the client better than you. You know, they've been there for years and years and, and, and they're already overloaded, you know, so giving them this com these complex plans, you know, over time, that's kind of just what you're supposed to do. And so for me, I got frustrated, you know, I was just, Frustrated with the process, frustrated with the the regulation, the all the things that are required. And so I just sat down one day and, you know, I had been reading Glenn Latham's The Power of Positive Parenting. I was getting ready. Uh, we were, you know, getting ready to have our own kids. So for really for me, it was somewhat selfish. I wanted to be a good parent. So I, I was looking at Rex and Forehands, the noncompliant child from the 70s. Now they've got several editions of that. They call it now Parenting the Strong-Willed Child. Uh, so Glenn Latham's work uh, was influenced, uh, Nicholas Long, Rex Forehand, their work, you know, from the 70s all the way up, and the principles of applied behavior analysis. So but what, what I came up with, you know, I started having conversations on, on, you know, hey, we have limited time. We have a lot, a lot of regulation. You know, how do we get the best, most effective technology transferred over to staff, over to parents uh, in the most efficient way so that we can get buy-in, they could see results early, and we could do it in a non-complex way so that it's fun and, and, and it's easy. Uh, that was a, you know, that was my goal. And so I started looking at what, what is required. Like if you have staff folks, what are the, what are the most critical skills that they need when interacting with a, with a learner who is going to challenge them in behaviorally sort of folks that are, I guess, behaviorally unattractive, you know, they're coming in, they don't have any skills. They go through orientation. They're not really trained on how to interact. So they typically rely on the way they were treated by their parents or by, by other people. So uh, the rapid training really evolved out of frustration with the system. Um, and I wanted to beat that, you know, I wanted to, have a solution with that. So if you look at parenting the strong-willed child, now that that was designed for kids between the ages of two and eight years old, and it, and it was designed for kids with ADD, ADHD. I really liked that work. So I said, you know, if this is working with this population, uh, look at these skills here. These are, it made sense to me. Let's take these core critical skills. Let's use principles of of applied behavior analysis. Let's look at Glenn Latham's work on siblings, uh, on working with neurotypical kids, and let's combine this into a program that makes sense to us. So we, well, you know, the credit really is to those folks. You know, I didn't really create this. You know, I took what I had, there was a need, there was a problem. I took from what I knew would work and I, and I sort of designed something that was memorable. You know, I knew rapid it, it communicates kind of what we want. We want to get your results as fast as we can. Um, and so rapid, uh, the five skills, rewarding, attending, providing breaks, ignoring non-dangerous behavior or minimizing attention. And the last one, direction giving. Those skills are required. You have to be able to, you have to know how to, and I don't mean with, I'm not talking about tangible rewards necessarily, although that is sometimes needed. But when you interact with the, the folks that we work with, you need to know how to effectively provide rewarding statements and you need to know how to interact with them and how to attend to them, which is different than rewarding. Attending is you're saying I'm interested in you. So attending is really beneficial for behavioral motivation, getting the getting the interactions positive so that the learner is looking for you, not not running away from you. Uh, and then providing breaks. There's, you know, in the book, it's called time out. But there's there's ways you can utilize breaks preventatively, especially with precursor intervention. So uh, we, we, we we modified that. We modified rewarding and attending. The obviously the the ignoring non-dangerous behavior is really just a, a set of minimization of attention 
how do you train a staff person to do that or a caretaker or a mom or dad? And then once they can do those things, then we get to the instruction, the direction giving part. And we break that down and we figure out how can we now that now that the interactions are more positive, and you'd be surprised at how it affects problem behavior just by changing those interactions. It's incredible. Uh, now we get to the instruction part. And so there is where we're at the behavior plan. Let's take these core critical interaction skills that, that mom and dad or staff, they're already successful. They're, they're already seeing results. And let's embed this into this plan in these terms so that they can understand them. So we don't use terms like we don't even use the term reinforcement. We call it rewarding because they just understand that. Um, and uh, so when they're when they are able to do these things, and we we train them not just in a pre and post test. We don't just do didactic instruction. We do that, but we do practice coaching and feedback in a BST model. So they are actually practicing these skills just like you would practice putting a tire on a car or fixing an, an engine, you know, we break it down and you'd be really surprised at how many times we, we work with folks and they say, I know how to do that. I know how to reward. I understand how to, we use timeout. I, I, you know, when we really break this down in baseline and we give them a set of data that shows them what they're doing, then we get buy-in because oftentimes they don't realize that when we ask them, for example, to play or just, you know, Here's a leisure activity. I want to observe you for five minutes. And we look and 90 percent of the interactions are questions and instructions, you know, and we we show them that and they go, wow, because we'll, we'll say, how do you think you did? And they'll go, I didn't give any instructions or any questions. And I understand I'm not criticizing them because I'm a parent myself. I understand. It's like when you're in the moment, you, it's like you can't see the forest for the trees. You know, you're that's your kid. When we show them the data, they are very surprised often, you know, at, wow, I can't believe that, you know. It, it's so easy to inadvertently do that. And so I, regardless of whether you're a behavior analyst or a layperson or what have you, obviously we as behavior analysts have, are, are, are more sensitive to those things <clears throat> perhaps. But, uh, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, so you guys have taken this kind of on the road a little bit or at least – Start or at least you're starting to uh, uh, use this yes. training in a variety of settings with a variety of different, uh, uh, I guess, uh, population groups, right? Yes, uh, and so you know, I, I would say from from like 2000, my first daughter was born in 2005. Uh, right around the time my second daughter was born in 2008, uh, right when the the market crash was occurring, um, my daughter was born with lysencephaly. Uh, lysencephaly is a cephalic disorder. It's a brain-based disorder. Uh, it means smooth brain. Uh, some folks might be familiar with microcephaly. You know, you see kids, sometimes they have a small head. and Micro mean, means small in brain. And so I would say right around 2008 is when we really started putting all – I started putting all this together. And what I did is I started testing it with my kids and then running it by, you know, all my colleagues uh, getting feedback, getting feed. I'm still getting on um, feedback. Um, and it's been refined for the last 10 years. So it is, we've designed the rapid training. Uh, of course we have a workshop for, uh, various trainings. Uh, and then we have the clinical aspect where we work really intensely for about 26 to 30 weeks with the family, uh, teaching them. We also will concurrently do an assessment. Uh, this fits into your assessment paradigm really well once you learn it. And then you embed it into the planning and meeting, still meeting all those requirements. Uh, but yeah, so we have a version for caretakers uh, and parents. We have a version for staff um, and we have a, a version for teachers. And then we're working on a version for uh, first responders, uh, EMS, police, uh, firemen, uh, community helpers um, as well. And so what, the real big benefit here is that when we start this program, we only start with requiring the caretakers to work for 10 minutes a day. You know, that's it. We get 10 minutes a day of them having solid, positive interactions with uh, the kids. You'd be, you, you get so much information just from that. And so once we get a good 10 minutes, then we, we beef that up to two settings with 10 minutes and then three settings with 10 minutes. And then pretty soon an hour, then we're doing mornings, then we're doing mornings through lunch. And then pretty soon, you know, the idea here is that we're giving them these critical skills that they need and it becomes part of their lifestyle. It's not a plan to be faded. It's not a it's not like a diet, 
you know, where you go on a plan, it's a lifestyle change. So they, they retain these skills for the rest of their lives and they benefit from them, uh, you know, for, for a very long period of time. So it, it is, it's been very successful and, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what we've been able to do and we're still working on, uh, extending its, its, uh, use and we're working with the University of Louisville. I've got a great team. Uh, Sharon True, our program director, Stephen Foreman, our business director. We've got a new compliance officer, a training coordinator. Of course, my wife is incredible. So, uh, and now the timing's really, really right. You know, it, it's, it has, it's such utility. There's so much utility here. I've kind of waited to get the right team in place before we extended it further. So we're, we are in that phase where we're working on this training. Uh, in multiple with multiple populations, because here the subject matter is the caretaker, not necessarily. I mean, the client sort of indirectly, obviously. But even when you train a plan, the the caretaker is the primary change agent. You know, oh, sure, so yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm excited to see how you guys have adapted this to uh, emergency services personnel or law enforcement, um, and, and yeah. perhaps to a lesser extent, teachers <clears throat> who may have mm-hmm. let less time to develop a relationship. Uh, with with with, uh, with the client, you know. Um, so um, sounds sounds like you got a lot of, again a lot of neat things going on there. Um, what uh, so um, I'm sure I'm going to get emails from folks saying where can I get rapid? You know, <laughs> this sounds awesome. Yeah. You know, like so I, I know. know you said you, you're developing some workshops and things like that. Yes. Um, I don't well, want to put you on yes. the spot, but, uh, you know, well, as far we, as disseminating this technology is concerned, wh- yeah. what, what are your plans uh, for that? For now, you can go to cbacares.com, uh, click on services, look for the rapid training link, click on that. There's a lot of resources there. We put in there uh, complimentary resources. There's there's a good PDF there that kind of outlines things for you. There's also some other information on on just, you know, what those skills are, you know, what the rationale is. Uh, so just go to cbacares.com, click on services, look for parent, teacher, caretaker, rapid training, click on that. Um, right now, we we had initially worked with uh, Dr. Pennington, uh, who who's now at uh, UNC Charlotte, who was at UofL. Um, we are also now currently working with Terry Scott, who's doing research on interactions with teachers in the classroom. So we're, we're collaborating. We're actively meeting with their coders. They have professional data collectors already set for uh, this. So we, we also um, have a really nice practicum program uh, with U of L and, and a couple of other uh, online universities where folks can, can work at CBA and get their degrees. So we have that, you know, research isn't, a, it, you know, it's not a big priority necessarily because, you know, it's just, it's not something we have time, but we're able to take sort of overlay some of this into what we're currently doing. We, uh, our, our business uh, director, Steve Foreman, recently got a grant um, with a, with a community organization uh, through the local feed organization, the Feed of Louisville, where where that all those funds are just going to be for training these staff on rapid skills training. And it's unique because the the agency is is um, it, it cares for for folks similar to what my daughter was diagnosed with. It's a medically fragile child pediatric community. Uh, program. So it's very unique. It's a unique provider type. Um, so, we, you know, in terms of that, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of those things. Um, and, and my ultimate goal is to get this ready for 2019 ABAI. I believe it's in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Have a panel, have a panel discussion, um, there on caretaker training with possibly with some of our colleagues, um, in other states and, and be able to, to discuss and disseminate more of this. But with originally with Dr. Pennington is getting a manual together um, so that uh, we can, you know, kind of package this in a way that it, that, that it can be um, put out in, into the public domain. Uh, but for now, the CBA cares.com go there. You, you'll get a lot of information. Um, there's just, there's so many things you could do with this. I, I, my goal is to stay focused on getting a manual together, getting this, uh, presentation panel discussion ready for next year's ABAI. Um, and hopefully that, you know, we'll get that together and we'll be able to get more feedback and then we'll get it out there. And, and plus, you know, it's just been a lot of fun doing this. I mean, people really tend to really eat this program up. Uh, new clinicians that we get that come in, they, they love it. You know, uh, it gives them when you first go into a home for the first time, it can be pretty intimidating, you know, uh, 
So we were able to give a, a clinical repertoire to our veteran staff, to our new staff, um, uh, that's very effective, that's based on principles consistent with behavior analysis. And so, yeah, I mean, we're doing we're doing all those things and uh, hopefully we'll have we'll have the, the manual done by next year and we'll be able to pitch it out at ABAI. Very cool. Uh, and I will link that CBA uh, that that uh, CBA cares dot com uh, and the services and all that stuff. I'll put those links okay. in the notes for this particular episode. So. Um, cool. Folks can go to behavioralobservations.com and check it out there. If you listen to the show for a little while, you definitely know by now that acceptance and commitment therapy is a very popular topic. That said, I often get emails from listeners asking questions about how they can receive additional training on ACT. And not just that, I hear from many BCBAs who want to learn how to implement ACT, but are rightly concerned with staying within their scope of practice. So it's for these reasons and more that I am excited to partner with Praxis Continuing Education to promote their upcoming ACT Boot Camp for Behavior Analysts that's being held in Baltimore, Maryland from September 27th to 30th. As the title of the event implies, this is specifically designed for BCBAs and not for social workers, clinical psychologists, mental health counselors, etc. And all told, there are 32 and a half Type 2 CEs that are available across the four-day boot camp experience including CEs that will satisfy your supervision and ethics requirements. Again, this event is designed to address the needs of the everyday behavior analyst and will be taught by leading figures in our field, such as Stephen Hayes, Jonathan Tarbox, Evelyn Gould, and Tom Sabo. So if this is something you're interested in, check out praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P. Listen, I know that's a mouthful, so I'm going to spell it. P-R-A-X-I-S cet.com forward slash BOP or you can simply go to the show notes of this episode where I'll have a link to it. If you do decide to attend and want to save $50 at registration, use the promo code BOP. I hope you get a chance to check this great event out. So as we were talking, uh, we talked a little bit yesterday uh, to kind of outline what we want to accomplish in this interview and uh, uh, what what came of that conversation was uh, well, at least part of it was a lot of uh, potential uh, yeah but questions about rapid right, yeah, right. so yeah, uh, right. Or, or, or potential yeah, sure. concerns or or critiques or what have you. So what I want to do is just kind of uh, and I, so as we were chatting, I I kind of made a little list of, of, of them. So I'm gonna throw them at you. I'm gonna throw you all the yeah okay. but questions. And, Let's do it, man. Uh, Let's go. So, all right. So yeah, this is good because this is what we want. We want, you know, that's what that's what makes this good. We want that feedback. You know, yeah. we want to be able to predict we want to be able to predict what what it is that we're going to get from everybody so that we can ad- adjust appropriately as needed or have a have a good response, you know. All right. So here we go. We're getting you ready for ABAI in Chicago. Um. <laughs> all right. Here we go. All right. Um, all right. So the uh, for the first kind of critique or, or issue that some people have raised is that uh, you're treat you're providing a treatment without a functional assessment. Right, oh. and I think that yes, How that's you, a, that? you know, yeah, I think that's a legitimate question. Uh, when you do a lit review and you look at what we're doing, um, you know, this is not a treatment program. This is a staff training, caretaker training program. So well, what we've been able to do though, um, so you know, we're not we're not we're not prescribing treatment. You know, uh, we do, we do a functional assessment uh, in the community. We have to do an indirect functional assessment. Um, and during that time, typically with our veteran clinicians, like right now we've got Sable Duchette, we've got Holly Birch, Jacob Powell, um, several others. Um, they are giving that value to the caretaker from day one. And they're concurrently doing the assessment because for your assessment and for your plan, if you can't, if you're going to train a group and they, and they're not able to demonstrate these skills effectively, you're going to have a failed plan. I don't care if it's the best plan, or if it's you know Doctor Know It All who wrote the plan, or or if it's just the greatest plan ever. If you if if the folks you're working with don't understand how to give directions, if they don't understand how to reward, how to attend, when to give breaks preventatively, uh, and if they if they're not if they're inefficient with those things, and typically without training, you, you know, folks are, um, then you're going to have a failed plan. So um, this this training pa- package is so versatile 
when, we, when we're able to observe and look at and train these critical interaction skills, we get tons of assessment information. Um, typically, we, we do this training. We start from day one. We do it with and concurrent with our assessment. Uh, but we also get we get tons of referrals just for private pay grants just to get this training to a group of staff or for a particular family or uh, the seven or eight districts that we're working with now that are that are just begging for more and more of this training. So, um, you know, there there's an aspect to, you know, do you and if you look in the literature, look at look at Rex Forehand, look at Glenn Latham. I mean, they're not there's no functional assessment part of their protocol. You know, they are putting together trainings. And and so the question is, and, and this is more of a research question that we'll be able to address with the, the crews that we're working with there at the University of Louisville is, you know, what effect does this have on behavior challenges, you know, during that time? For me as a, as a clinician, because I'm a trained clinician, I think of it like the getting the, getting the inertia, getting the ball rolling. If we can get the assessment done, and then I've got mom, dad, they're practicing how to be more effective and how to interact. And again, these are all antecedent based, you know, how to we're, we're, we're designing it as an antecedent training package. By the time we get to the plan training, they're already rewarding and attending. They've learned how to give directions better. And they're bought into this and they are primed and ready. That's just another part of the frustration I had, because typically what was going on with the required things here in Kentucky, you know, you can only do like a couple hours a week. So it would take sometimes six to 12 weeks to get an assessment done. The family's waiting. They're frustrated because they're like, what's going on? You know, and we're like, well, it's the regulatory things, you know, we, we can only do, they're only allowing us to do a little bit here, a little bit there. It's not like commercial insurance. Um, and, and then we get a plan. And sometimes I've even seen three months go by and then they get to a plan and the families, and they're so frustrated at that point in time, they're done with you. So we flipped that with RAPID, incorporating that and weaving it into what we do um, as part of and concurrent with the assessment. Instead of being frustrated, they're ready to go. They're primed and ready. And we're also continuing because, you know, assessment never stops. Uh, we're constantly, we're getting data 24 hours a day. And we're able to evaluate these things, you know, at least uh, in an applied way, you know, with with some partial interval or frequency type data that, that you know, we're not gathering in observer agreement, but we're getting enough clinical data to make good decisions here. And I, and so some of these questions need to be answered by research groups. And, and, and we're leaving that up to the academics out there to do that. We're, our doors are open. We're currently working with uh, Terry Scott and the department there, the uh, uh, we've also worked uh, with Eric and Molly Dubuque and wonderful people here, amazing program. So there's still work to be done there. But the evidence-based component of this is that rewarding is effective. It, it, it's defined by its effects, uh, reinforcement. Um, you know, if you have better interactions before the problem behavior occurs, you know, and, and you're able to deli deliver more reinforcement, we know, we know what that does. There, there's research for that. We also know if you're a better instructor, if you if you're providing clear instructions um, and instead of, uh, you know, defective instructions, per se, you're going to just have better uh, success. So there's there's a real proactive part of this. There's a momentum component uh, for the caretaker. There's a buy in component. There's a, you know, getting results from day one component. Uh, really, I don't know how things are in other states uh, except like Texas and a few others. But uh, all this was designed out of the frustration with that system. So really, it was put together to give the most value to the caretakers and parents. Because as a parent myself, I we had in-home services, and, and uh, so you know I learned a lot from 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 that experience, caring for my daughter, having people come to my home. My home became a hospital, you know, and, and your home is then no longer a home. So we, I was just heavily motivated to get some a package together. For, for these caretakers who 80% of the time their, their marriage is on the rocks or there's a, there's a financial problem or substance abuse problem. There's, you know, I think it's 80% of the time when you have a child with a disability, you know, you're likely to get a divorce. So my motivation was to, to, to address all those problematic areas. And in doing that, I think we've, I think we've got something pretty special, you know, from this. Cool. Um, another, 
I guess, uh, potential critique or, uh, you know, a concern or whatever is that, uh, um, that it's overly simplistic or it's stuff that everyone knows, uh, you know, yeah. uh, or, you know, so, uh, you know, how, how would you address those concerns? L- let's say you have a new clinician who joins the team. It's, oh yeah, yeah. well, I, uh, you know, we, of course I tell people how to, you know, use reinforcement and things like that. Well, <clears throat> I say, show me, you know, show me. Um, because yeah, it, it's designed to be simple on paper. It has to be. And that, that's a direct response too, to all the complexity of all the requirements and all the things, you know, we, that there's our F, FA and BSP audit checklist is 155 items. Really? So to, yes. So to meet the auditor guidelines, and we've got it, of course, we've got it broken down into, we have a scorecard system that we use. And so when we train folks, you know, we score their assessments and plans. It's 155 items between the two documents that have to be accounted for. So what, you know, when you're looking at a system like that, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, response effort and, and over, over complex. The simplicity thing is, so what? You know, it's supposed to be. Um, I know in my training with Jesus Rosales and Shala and Sigrid and Janet, Cloyd Heighton at UNT, we we they gave us assignments, you know, and they would say, develop this training. We would bring it and and Jesus would say, nope, do it over. You need to make this so a high school student could could implement it. So, you know, back then I was like, what is he talking about? You know, but now obviously I understand. So um, I think there this this element of complexity is a problem for what we're doing. You know, it's, it's problematic. We need to make sure that uh, we can be effective when we're transferring technology through, you know, a behavior skills training or whatnot over to a caretaker. If you've got a complex program, I can tell you as a parent myself, I'm going to throw it in the trash because my life is complex enough. Sure. I don't need, I don't need, you know, you're walking into an, a, a situation where there's tons of demands already, you know? So that's why we start and it. And we tell our folks, you know, just give us 10 minutes a day at first. That's all we need. And, and, and I've had a lot of folks and we've worked with thousands of families, you know, and they'll, they'll start out saying this, you know, we had so-and-so before we had five BCBA before, and we waited three months to get a, a, a damn plan in place. I just say, give me 10 minutes a day for a couple of weeks and then, then you can make a judgment on it. And, and what I see from just from that one little aspect is the simplicity of this program is part of is what makes it strong because the implementation of this is by, is by far, it's not simple. You, you have to practice, you know, putting a tire on a car is simple, right? But if you don't know what you're doing and you don't have the right tools, you're going to get frustrated. You're not going to know how to do it. That tire is pretty heavy. You need to know how to, you know, how to do all those steps. So you now that's the way I see that argument. I, I just see it as a moot point because what, what matters is the data and the outcomes, not the, the, you know, simplicity or complexity. If you've got a complex program that works great, I want to see it. I want to see the outcomes because in the community, you better have something pretty straightforward and simple. Otherwise I can tell you from my experience, it's going to get tossed in the trash. Got it. Um, and then the last kind of concern is, uh, what about the funding source? You know, uh, you know, we always hear that, uh, you know, if it's not directly related to, you know, medical necessity, et cetera, you know, um, funding is, is difficult to come by. And I'm probably like the least informed person on how that works. Cause I primarily consult the school, uh, schools, but how do you guys address that from a funding perspective, uh, particularly yeah, bill, a- billing insurance and things like that? That's a good question. You know, I think that's a valid question. And, you know, what we've done and um, initially when when this first program went out, it was in San Antonio, Texas. I was with Alonzo Andrews. Uh, I was contracted there. CBA was contracted with the Autism Treatment Center. They have a school. So this started out with grants. So we got we actually got a grant initially from the hospital. Uh, We worked with the pediatric group there and. and the main, you know, autism ATC with Ivy Zwicker uh, and uh, uh, Anna, uh, all those folks that are connected were connected to the governor back then uh, in, with autism, and we were able to get grants. So initially, grant I say, you know, seek out grants, but also, and this depends. I don't. There's really not a. This is more of a gray area because it depends on your state guidelines. You know, read your licensure law, look at your regulation 
guidelines for your funding source and ask yourself, are these skills important for this particular family or this particular child? And if so, how do I incorporate this into what we need in terms of treatment? Because what we're able to do here is when we do our assessment, we're, we're getting information on the fact that that, that caretaker is really, def- say, for example, just say they're defective on that rewarding skill. Well, that's going to be a big part of your plan and training them. You know, you're going to have to be able to deliver an effective rewarding statement and you're going to have to be able to effectively label and imitate behavior, which is attending, which is functionally different from rewarding. You're going to have to be able to ignore non-dangerous behavior. You know what I mean? These are critical, critical, the most basic critical skills. So I just say, you know, we start with grants look at look at how it might, you know, if you wanted to take like take this to court, you know, you could kind of look at it and go. These are critical skills that every every potential treatment plan is going to need. It's not a cookie cutter program. The rapid program for Johnny and Jane are going to look different because their reinforcers are different, their histories, the ontogeny, everything's different. So the the way you attend to one person might not even include a verbal statement. I have I know you know clients they just like for you to do a wrestling move just in the air or, or a tap on the shoulder, you know, you have to know the client, you know, you have, and so we do all that through a, a complimentary screening and we do a free, free, what we call a PIA to preliminary intake. We get tons of information right off the bat, even before the first session. I'm all about being as proactive as you can. So in terms of funding, if you can't do it, you can't do it. But what I'm saying is you're going to be doing it anyway, at some point. I see. That makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about some of the best practices so uh, for implementing rapid you know um you know, so we've described kind of how you why you developed it uh, briefly what it is and again people can go back to session 36 to you know kind of get into more detail about each one of those letters in the acronym yeah but you guys obviously have tons of experience uh, <clears throat> training people and getting um you know uh, getting these skills off the ground. So what have you found that works really well in terms of uh, implementing this program? I think, I think integrity of treatment is an important variable too. Um, and when you're looking at that complexity variable, you're look, we're looking at the integrity of the overall program. We're looking at too at the length of the length of service, you know, um, if we're spending more time, you know, being frustrated and not and having to spend another three months on just getting the folks to buy into the whole concept of the service. I mean, there's a lot of advantages to, to this particular program. Um, no, I think it's a sta- it's a good standalone program. So in terms of a staff training program, uh, you know, Denny Reed has published a lot of really good, uh, straightforward, uh, strategies for training staff. Um, there's tons of staff training out there, but very few of them have an actual competency component. Very few of them have an actual uh, behavior skills training component. So it's a standalone program. <clears throat> also, you know, do you need your trainees to be able to do these p- critical skills well? Uh, and if you do, you need to assess these skills and so that that's part of your assessment. Um, and so there, there you have a, another, you know, standalone and then it's weaved within your assessment because you are obviously and it depends on the client, depends on the funding, it depends on so many different variables. I would say the majority of the time we find that whoever it is we're working with, they oftentimes don't even really fully understand what a demand is. They just don't. They weren't trained and I don't expect them to. You know, they. They, they don't understand when they point to the chair and look firmly. That's a demand context. You know, that, that that's counted as a demand. You know, there's things like that. So you just have to ask yourself questions in terms of funding. Uh, and so we've got so much uh, grant um, work and private, you know, private clients and private clients that, that get this service. We What we do is we give free in services on this. So, for example, the local um, county, uh, seven counties or the local uh, – like MHMR type of agency, we'll just offer free service, a free in service. We'll go, we'll we'll acclimate them to what this program is, and typically we get referrals the next day. And so, you know, it, it's either a standalone or it's part of your initial assessment because it's relevant because it's going to be part of your treatment. 
and uh, you know you're capitalizing on on the integrity of the program. You're getting the buy-in uh, quicker, and then by the time you get to that plan, you're not dealing with all the frustration of of, of everything because they're they've already taken the, that this to a whole new level. They're giving you feedback. They're telling you what's working and what's not. And what you do is you shape up through these five skills the treatment protocol, and you do it with no technical terms, with lots of data, and with lots of participation. On the caretaker part, so you know those two those two things are important for me. And when you emphasized earlier about starting small, for example, ten minutes a day, what obviously the the, the data would be the guide of sorts. But um, you know what what, what mm -hmm. sort of intervals or increments do you step up? You know, once you see some of these skills being acquired by the yeah. various stakeholders that you've trained. Yeah, and I, you know, a lot of the time I'll just use an example. Like the attending skill is typically new. Most people aren't aren't used to hearing uh, attending, and I think of attending if you have a social component, and if your if your learner is engaged and they find value in in, in social interaction, attending uh, is easier, obviously. But if they don't, there's things you can do as well. Attending is when you label and imitate. The, the, the learner's behavior, the, the learner's appropriate behavior. So adults do this all the time. You know, we look at each other. We sh you shake your head. I shake my head. You wink at me. I wink at you. You do a fist pump. I do a fist pump. Why do we do that? Where I'm saying, you know, we're saying I'm interested in you, you know. It, of course, it could function as reinforcement, but, you know, we're, we're, we're more interested at that time in getting that skill acquired. So, um you know, getting them uh, acclimated to, to doing that and, and, and training them, we do it from that data set. And really, when, we, when we're working on these skills, we do it in that 10-minute interval because, you know, we want them successful. We typically start with an activity that's easy for them so that they can practice. So there's no demands typically at all um, from the beginning. And, and we want them to contact reinforcement. We want the caretaker to see value in this. I mean, I, I test it all the time just – for a two minute thing with the new kid, I'll just start attending to that child. And it changes a lot of that child's behavior. It depends on the child, but a lot of times some kids will just start complying. But, you know, there's, there, it depends on the kid. You know, you have to really base it on that individualization of that. So uh, the 10 minutes a day is to, is to, is to get them uh, fluent and acclimated to what it is you're doing. And then uh, uh, you, know, you go from there. I see. Uh, Jason, is there anything else you want to say about Rapid before we uh, move on? The next topic. Um, no, I I just want to say that what you're doing is incredible here with the behavioral observation pod, podcast. I think it's amazing. Uh, I, I feel lucky to be here, and so I'm open, you know, to questions. People can contact me. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to you know to share this information, um, and I look forward to seeing everybody next year at ABBA. Uh, so, um, you know. so we will. Um, yeah. So we'll, I'll I'll. Um, post the contact page of CBA uh, in the show notes. So if people want to get a hold of you, they, they can do that. Um, sure. Before we, before we leave off here, um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about or give you an opportunity to talk about um, CBA more generally. Uh, I know you guys have been uh, refurbishing or, or um, this uh, huge facility that you're you're about to open and things like that. So what, why don't you why don't you yeah. take a minute and tell us about you know what you guys have uh, going on uh, in in Louisville? Well, I owe a lot of this to my team. My wife, Robin Simmons, she's been incredible. I couldn't do this without her. You know, she's been the administrative uh, executive director for the last ten years. Um, like I'd said before, I've got a really strong team of BCBAs that have experience in business and experience in, in, in directing and management. Uh, so, you know, the timing has been good. Uh, the building itself has taken a little while. It's very expensive. You know, dealing with contractors is not always fun, but we're, we're about 95 percent done. And we've been providing community services uh, for a very long time, uh, about 18 years. Uh, so we've added the center based component because, you know, there's. There's advantages for some to, to be able to train in a more controlled environment. And then most of our program there will be an early intervention program. It'll be a very intensive or an intensive 
um, component uh, to working with young kids that have a diagnosis of autism or another uh, brain-based neurological disorder. Um, so we've been, I've been working on this building for two years. Um, it's, it's just about done. Uh, there's a lot to, that I've learned over that period of time too, just about buildings and construction inspections and, and requirements. So, you know, I would say maybe October, uh, we'll, you know, right now we are, we are, um, I would say 60% of the buildings finished. So we are seeing some limited clients on a consultative basis on site. We're going to be able to have, a uh, uh, assessment and, uh, treatment uh, for severe behavior disorders clinic there where we can run, um, you know, true experimental multi-element uh, functional analyses for the folks that really need that type of intensive assessment. Plus, we, we work with adults who have brain injuries, uh, uh, acquired or traumatic brain injuries, and we have a behavioral counseling aspect that, that, that we can, that we'll be able to provide on site that will follow up into the community. So we'll have, we'll, we'll be able to diversify and provide an additional service to the community. It's to me, you know, it's, it's really, um, um, it's really what our ultimate goal has been. It's just been, it's been difficult to get there, you know, cause every time we would move, we would, we would be full in three months and need more space. So we've got this huge building. We're not going to move. Uh, we've got a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of space to work with. Is it like 13,000 square feet or something like that? Yeah. Yes. And, yes. And it, and it needed total renovation. So it has brand new electric, brand new plumbing, brand new HVAC, brand new drywall, brand new floors, brand okay. new. So you guys took it, you took it down to the studs basically. Yeah. And pretty much. Started yeah. over. Well, it was, a, and it was a big like open dance hall kind of place, you know? So we, we, you know, we, uh, it had these old like 12 ton Chrysler water cooler air conditioning units that they sent, da, 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 you know? So we had to take, a lot of time to, to, to do all this. I do some of that work myself too. And I'll tell you, de demo is therapeutic. You pick up a <laughs> sledgehammer and start not just start tearing up stuff there. There's some it's therapy there too. So I, I did a lot of the demo myself. Um, so yeah, it's been good and fun. And I'm just, again, I'm just so fortunate to have such a great team. You know, Kentucky is just a surprising place and there's so many cool things about it. Um, I'm just, I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to open a center for behavior analysis. I never, ever would have thought that, that we would actually have this opportunity. So we're going to open a lot of, uh, programs, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, and I, I think we'll have a better relationship with the practicum sites, you know, more controlled time, uh, you know, more on-site community is difficult for practicum, man. You gotta, if you've got to have two people there in the community, it, scheduling travel uh those things can be challenging at times you know we we've gotten pretty good at being proactive with everything but you know this adds a diverse service that's needed you know we'll be able to do it on a pretty big scale that's that's cool um talk to me a little bit about louisville because i know we've chatted about it previously but it um you know I, and i'm gonna I, i've never been there and you know it's we're gonna those... down well, all right, we're going right. to get you down. All right, well, I'll, I'll hold you to that. But uh, uh, you know, yep. it, you know, I think some people when they you, when you hear the word Kentucky, it you know, conjures up perhaps some uh, some uh, inaccurate and perhaps unfair and perhaps uncharitable yes. uh, you know notions yeah. and things like that. Um, and I'm just talking Colonel about Sanders. someone who's born and raised in the Northeast, uh, and yeah. um, you know, so um, well, I, I know that's not the case because I've been a I've, you know I've I've, I've I've lived in the deep south for a little bit and I know you know that anyway I'm, I'm probably going to stop because I'm going to put my foot <laughs> in my mouth and uh, further I should it's say. a great place so yeah before it's I a great yeah, place. <laughs> help me out here so what's cool about Louisville <laughs> well I'll tell you I'm from Texas you know and I, I lived in Dallas I lived in Fort Worth San Antonio Austin. Um, when I came to Louisville, you know, I had no idea what to expect. Louisville is a compassionate city. The mayor here, um, and we, we recently had lunch. He does a lunch in here for community businesses. And I mean, that's how cool this guy is, Greg Fisher. Now, I think he's running for president too, uh, at some point, but, uh, Louisville is a compassionate city. You know, they, they, they have these compassion goals. Uh, yeah, even what I've, Red, you know, the, this during the Civil War, Louisville was a, was a neutral place, uh, you know, so it's got that historical compassion component, uh, you know, 
it's uh, it's diverse. It kind of reminds me of Austin, Texas. I don't know. It's got a vibe to it. You know, like the Keep Louisville w- Weird. You know mm-hmm. that can't you ever see the little bumper stickers? Oh, sure. Keep yeah, Keep Louisville Weird, like sort of the Seattle. Austin, the cool vibe. And I like that progressiveness about Louisville. Now, you, the Colonel Sanders, you know, thing is, yeah, with what you think of. And that's kind of, you know, what I, when I came here, I was like, there's no way I'm going to go to Kentucky, you know, but I'm glad I did because not only that, the good thing about Louisville is they have so many services available. If you have a child that needs services compared to other states, it's wow. You can get 40 hours of services here through a Medicaid waiver. It's incredible. Never even heard of that. So mm-hmm. there's that aspect. There's, you know, it's you know, if you're if you're out on Barstown Road and it's it's normal to see a group of, of guys walking down the street with wheelchairs and, you know, uh, diverse individuals. And it's just a normal thing for this city. I've been in other cities where it's not so normal to see that level of diversity. So one of the core values of uh, Louisville is that that diversity. And uh, you can see it here. There's so many things to do. The Derby. Is a big deal and a big party. The Thunder over Louisville kicks off with this huge fireworks show. It's like one of the biggest fireworks shows ever in the world. Uh, they have a chow wagon. I mean, there's just so many things to do. And there is a, if you're a foodie, you would like it here because there's like a foodie element here. Uh, chef Lee has a cool place here. He was a top chef on that show. Top chef. He won that. Uh, he has two restaurants here. So there's a foodie element. There's great services. And it's right on the river. They call it the River City. So you've got boating. You've got activities on the water, water skiing, um, you know, uh, and it's it's accessible to Nashville in just a couple of hours. You get to St. Louis in a couple of hours. You get to Chicago, four or five hours. You know, it's uh, I think UPS's main hub is right here in Louisville because you can get to so many places. If you look on the map, Louisville's right in the heart of America, you know. It's just right there. It's kind of like it's the south, but it's just right on the line there, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and, and, and it's very progressive now. Louisville, Lexington and then Florence. Uh, we have a we have a, a clinic in Lexington, a twenty five hundred square foot uh, intensive clinic there. Ashley Ratliff is our um, we have several folks that are that are running that clinic uh, over there. Uh, we have an office in Florence, which is south of Cincinnati. It's beautiful. You can get up there in an hour and a half and go to Cincinnati. Uh, they have a Geta Fest up there. Geta is like a type of meat. Uh, it's it's there's so many cool things here, you know. Uh, so I this is my adopted hometown now. You know, I, this is my power spot. I, I love Louisville. Well, so, yeah. Whenever I talk to you guys, you guys seem awfully proud of the uh, the area. So it sounds. Sounds pretty cool. Um, yeah. All right, so I think uh, I think we've uh, hopefully uh, enticed people to think more about uh, you know or differently about that area of the country, um, given given your strong endorsement of it. So, well, um, I, I, I listen. I invite any BCBA from here around the world to come. Just come to Louisville. Let us know you're here. We'll we'll take care of you. You can ask Pat Fryman. You can ask uh, Greg Hanley, Doctor Heward. Jose Martinez Diaz, we, we, uh, Vince Carbone, we've had all of these folks here and, you know, talk to them about it. You know, they, they've been here. Uh, anybody wants to come down here, just give me a ring and, and we'll, uh, we'll arrange a time for you. All right. Very cool. So uh, before we let you go uh, for the rest of your day there, Jason, um, I want to, I want to end the podcast with uh, any parting advice you might have for newly minted BCBA. <clears throat> wow. Um, yeah, there's a there's for a newly minted BCBA. Yeah, yeah. Someone did, let's say someone just graduated, they just passed the test, um, just looking for a job or just started their first job. I, I think that you know, well, the, I think the, one of the most important things for me was when I when I graduated from the University of North Texas. Uh, my thesis committee, uh, Sigrid Glenn, was part of that, and she gave me some advice that I thought was really valuable. At the time, I didn't fully understand, you know, what she meant. But when you – I did later. When you go get a job, um, you really want to make sure that that environment is supportive of a behavioral community. A lot of the jobs that are offered out there, you know, might be driven by a, a different set of uh, values or, or, or different discipline. So I think it's important that, you know, you have the, 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 a behavioral community to work in and then you have a um, support. You have the support, the supervision that you need. 
Uh, that's another thing I think you need to make sure because a lot of the folks here and there's there's a lot of great agencies around here, uh, you know, ensure that you're provided with that direct uh, supervision. Even if you're a BCBA, you still need, especially as a newly minted one, you're still going to need oversight supervision. So uh, behavioral community, uh, oversight supervision and support. You really I think those are the core things is, is that uh, you need that that level of support when you go into a new a new place. It's important. All right. Great words to end with. Jason Simmons of Clinical Behavior Analysis, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.